So during the development of the RC hypercar, I, I realized a couple of things. First off, I'm a terrible RC car driver. Secondly, with an RC car, all of the feedback that you have about how the car is handling is purely visual. And this car is so fast, it's impossible to both watch the car and look where you're actually going at the same time. So I wanted to come up with some sort of solution so I could actually feel what was going on in the car. And in a real race car, you get a lot of sensation through the steering wheel, obviously, and through the forces going through the car, but I had never seen a force feedback steering wheel for an RC car. So I decided to go ahead and build my own. I knew right away what I wanted to accomplish with the force feedback system. I needed to be able to feel what was going on in the RC car itself, but a force feedback system in an RC car is not an easy thing to do. These cars are small, lightweight, and fast, and the feedback you're going to receive because they're so lightweight and fast is going to be very dynamic and actually at a much higher frequency than you would get from a, like a road car steering wheel. So I went ahead and I just made a list of everything that I didn't know how to do for this project. The first was how do you actually build a transmitter that accurately recreates the steering forces of the car. And I was like, how do you quickly send that information back and forth between the RC car and the transmitter? So you don't have a disconnect between what the car is doing and the actual force feedback you're feeling. And then how do you model or measure the forces going through an RC car to create that force feedback? In my mind, initially the hardest problem to solve was how to actually create a force feedback transmitter. I knew I wanted a compact system that would fit into a traditional RC transmitter form factor. I also knew I needed a motor of some kind to provide the actual force feedback. Initially, I planned on just using a cheap high turn brushed motor, and that would have been the smart thing to do for an initial prototype but I became obsessed with the demos for the haptic control knobs I saw on Simple FOC's website. And these haptic knobs use a brushless gimbal motor, an encoder, a microcontroller, and a driver board, and the Simple FOC library. And I thought it would be very easy because of all the code examples for these haptic knobs already. I was so young and innocent back then. So this diagram shows my initial design for the RC transmitter. The steering wheel is directly mounted to an 80 kV brushless gimbal motor. On the back of the motor is a magnet that actually spins with the motor. And below that magnet is an encoder, which reads the angle of the motor, both for commutation and the actual steering angle on the steering wheel. To drive the motor, I used the simple FOC mini driver board, which is about $15 and it's great. It has a DRV 8313 triple half H bridge chip to actually drive the three poles of the gimbal motor. And lastly, one of the microcontrollers supported by the simple FOC library is the ESP32, which is fortuitous as I am familiar with the ESP32. It's very fast. It supports a long range Wi-Fi protocol and has a fast bi-directional communication protocol called ESP now. So I started researching how force feedback steering wheels actually work at a high level. You just get a force feedback value from either a physics model or some sort of sensor on the car. And that just has a positive or a negative value and the steering wheel actually recreates that torque. I thought this was going to be really easy since simple FOC already had a torque based controller where you just supply that information, basically a current value, and it makes that amount of torque on the motor. But the challenge is much more difficult when you actually look at how we're receiving the data from the RC car. We're not going to receive a true analog signal. We're going to receive a digital signal, which is going to have a whole bunch of discrete values separated by some period of time. And we want to basically make a nice smooth response with the steering wheel. So when I started looking at all this, it starts to become very evident that timing is very important for force feedback steering wheels. We receive force feedback wirelessly from the RC car at anywhere between 80 and 120 Hertz. The simple FOC library actually updates the angle of the encoder and does its own looping at about one kilohertz, maybe a little bit faster at times. 
signal filtering and dampening for the force feedback has to run at a minimum of 500 hertz. And to make sure all of these processes continue to run on a scheduled basis and in priority order, we have to use something like FreeRTOS to multi-thread this across the two processors on the ESP32. Because if anything is delayed or falls out of sync, uh, you actually do feel it as dead spots in the steering. And that's how I started off. I just started off with one big loop and tried to do it all at once. And the steering felt absolutely terrible. So the other piece I found in all of this as I started to build this force feedback steering wheel was that filtering and tuning really are the biggest parts of this entire project. Simple FOC and the gimbal motor itself don't actually respond instantaneously. And we have some lag from the actual wireless transmissions. Sensor data is messy. Sensor readings, they have the noise. They vary a little bit with some jitter. Depending on the actual type of sensor, we have different sample rates. For example, I'll talk about later, there's a load cell that I use at one point, and that's about 80 hertz. Some of my other sensors that I was using on the RC Hypercar, I'm able to query those at about one kilohertz, but I can only pass it over wirelessly at about 200 hertz. So we really need to smooth all that data that we're getting in from the sensor so that we don't have any excessive spikes from this noise. But at the same time, if you know anything about filtering, the more we smooth out the signal we receive from the RC car and the sensors, the more fidelity we lose in the force feedback. So any of the high frequency feedback starts to get lost as well as we start to actually introduce a lag because we need to have a certain number of readings go through the filter to smooth it out. And so what it ends up being is this development process is a whole lot of back and forth tuning with different types of filters and different values for those filters to ensure that you try to recreate as much information as possible. I had a limited amount of time. There's definitely uh, more that could be done, but I, I'm pretty happy with where it's at right now. The other thing as I was developing the steering wheel, I found that I need to actually recreate some of the missing forces that you would have in a full-size car steering system. This steering wheel has very little weight and almost no friction with the motor and very small forced variations can send the steering wheel spinning or into hysteresis. So we need to give the steering wheel some weight. And to do that, we have to simulate the forces that are in a real steering system. And one of them being the static and the dynamic frictional forces. We need to dampen the steering wheel to give it that feeling of resistance and weight. Okay, so this is a slide of just the actual threads that I had to create on the microcontroller itself just to kind of lay out the processes that I'm running. I have a dedicated thread that does nothing but actually on an interval send the data and then I actually have an interrupt that actually receives the data back from either the RZ car or the transmitter because it is bi-directional. So the transmitter is sending over the steering and the throttle and the car is just sending back a force feedback number. And the reason for this is I want as little data being transmitted over wireless as possible because anything that I have to send over wireless can introduce lag. I have a thread that does nothing but read the throttle and the steering angles and filter those accordingly. I also have a thread that just implements the simple FOC loop. And so that's basically just reading the encoder and over and over again, recalculating the commutation of the gimbal motor. And then the last process, which is the most important process, is running about a thousand times a second. And I'm actually processing the steering wheel torque. So I'm calculating the steering wheel's angular velocity. I'm calculating the frictional force in the steering wheel. I'm calculating the uh, damping force in the steering wheel. And I'm also calculating the force feedback. So based on the force figure that comes from the RC car, I translate that into a force that I'm going to put through the steering wheel. And then as the last step, you basically just add up the friction, the dampening and the force feedback values. And since those can be plus or minus values, you essentially end up with a total force or a total torque that you need the gimbal motor to create. And you just pass that to the simple FOC controller and it recreates that force. 
So once I had the code all kind of written for all those different processes and pieces, I 3D printed the world's saddest ever RC transmitter case, basically just a framework to be able to hold all the components together. And I wired up a battery and I started testing and tuning. Uh, again, it's a rough prototype. I did end up adding a steering stop on the steering wheel itself. Initially, I played with not having a mechanical stop on the steering range for the wheel, but it just draws a lot of power from the motor to create like a virtual stop. And there's no real reason for this. The steering wheel does have a calibration routine because it can get misaligned when you take it apart a bunch of times. It first does the simple FOC calibration, which just detects where the motor poles are relative to the angle of the encoder. Then it turns left as far as possible, records the angle, turns right as far as possible, records that angle, and then it centers itself. So if we look closer here at the transmitter, I'm running a 3S battery and two buck converters. Uh, the minimum voltage for the DRV8313 motor driver I'm using is about 10 volts. Initially, I did directly wire the driver to the 3S battery, but what happens is the force feedback starts to vary as the voltage output of the battery drops, you know, as it's being discharged. So the buck converter is actually set at 10 volts, which the battery should never hopefully get that low in voltage. And the other buck converter is there just to drop the voltage a bit for the ESP32, just to save a little bit on heat. The gimbal motor is actually quite strong. I only run it at about 250 milliamps, maybe 300 milliamps or so. It's strong enough that you can't really get a good grip on it at that strength. So I have it usually turned down a little bit more for the force feedback itself. Your fingertips are actually surprisingly sensitive to small variations in torque. So let's talk about the RC car side of things and how to actually sense the forces that are traveling through the steering mechanism. I did a lot of research on full-size cars that use a steer-by-wire system, and these are cars with steering wheels which are not directly connected to the steering mechanism of the car. Essentially, it's all electronic and handled by motors. Infinity and a lot of other cars, manufacturers are starting to do this. The vast majority of these cars utilize a strain gauge or a torque sensor that measures the forces coming through the steering mechanism and recreate those forces with a motor that drives the steering wheel. This is actually the easiest and probably most accurate way to recreate force feedback because you are directly measuring the forces of the steering. Unfortunately, commercially available strain gauges or torque sensors tend to be either too large for an RC car, not accurate enough, or they're very, very expensive. So naively, I of course figured the RC hypercar already has a ton of sensors on it. So surely I can create a model that captures all of the steering forces and can recreate an accurate force feedback model for the car. The biggest contributor to steering feel and performance is something called the aligning torque or the self-aligning torque. And this is the torque actually created by the deformation of the tire itself during cornering. It's often referred to as pneumatic trail. So I'm not gonna go into a full explanation of pneumatic trail and slip angle and all these other things, but I'm going to link to a wonderful article on race car engineering's website that goes into how all of this works. But the reason that the self-aligning torque is so important is because it actually diminishes as the tire reaches maximum lateral force output that has to do with actually basically at finding the optimal slip angle for the tire. And there's a point where the tire has deformed so much that it's not going to generate any more grip. And you can feel that in the steering mechanism. This is great for race cars because you can actually feel that drop off in the aligning torque in the steering wheel, which allows you to perfectly balance the car right on the limits of adhesion. So I figured with a lot of math and some sensor data, I could probably reasonably estimate the self-aligning torque. The challenge is you need really good tire data about the tires you're using so that you can input them into a very complex mathematical model that allows you to accurately estimate the deformation of the contact patch at different loads. And it turns out after a couple of months of digging into this, it is possible, but I wasn't gonna get there anytime soon. <laughs> 
Yeah, I can feel the bumps. As you can see, I went ahead and built this model. I tested it, I tuned it to the best of my abilities and I went out and tested it. And oh my gosh, it was terrible. At low speeds, the car was drivable, uh, but it wasn't good. At medium speeds, it became absolutely dangerous because the forces coming back through the steering wheel did in no way match up to the car itself. So it was time for plan B and luckily, in my stash of parts, I had a smallish 20 kilogram bi-directional load cell. And bi-directional just means it can sense forces both in tension and compression. The load cell is pretty big, it's kind of heavy. So I had to go ahead and bring out the old RC-10T. So I designed some 3D prints to actually make the load cell into a giant tie rod that was between the steering servo and the steering mechanism itself. And then I designed a whole new electronics package for the RC-10T to control the car and read the forces from the load cell while it was driving. And this is where the sponsor for this video, JoyaLens, actually saved the day by sending me this awesome digital microscope. If you've worked with electronics and you don't have a digital microscope, you really need one. I had no idea how much of a difference this would make for my workflow with electronics. Uh, this thing is amazing. The screen is absolutely huge at like 10.1 inches and it comes with multiple lenses that allow magnification anywhere from 60x up to 2040x. When I was using the RC Hypercar initially, I actually had to desolder and move a tiny 0.6 millimeter resistor. Without the microscope, I wouldn't have been able to have done this. And the best part was I was actually able to take the whole RC Hypercar and put it under the digital microscope. The Joyo Lens microscope has all of these additional arms so that you can uh, raise the microscope up very high and you have a ton of space to be able to put something under it. And for the load cell that I was utilizing with the RC-10T, I had to make some modifications to the load cell amplifier. The PCB had to have some traces cut and I needed to actually solder some tiny leads between some of the pins on the load cell chip so that I could change it from 10 hertz up to 80 hertz. You can see just from these pictures how small the little tiny hidden trace was that was under the chip that I had to cut and it wouldn't have been something I would have even attempted without this microscope. And as a bonus for me, I can actually capture content with this microscope because it comes with an SD card and so I can take pictures and record video with it and I can actually share it as part of my projects and my build process. Joya Lens throws in every conceivable accessory you could want for a microscope. I mean, it comes with an SMD parts organizer and an ESD mat for placing all the components and soldering SMDs. Uh, there's a slide holder for utilizing like a traditional glass slide. It has a remote. You can output the video to HDMI. You can actually hook it up to a computer and take measurements. It's actually kind of my favorite new toy. So I highly recommend picking one of these up if you don't have one. It's so much better than any of the other solutions I've used for doing close-up work. Check them out at the link in the description below, and you'll be seeing me use this a lot in upcoming videos. So as I alluded to, the electronics on the RC-10T are very simple. It's just an ESP32. It has an HX711 load cell amplifier that I've set up to run at 80 hertz and it has a buck converter to power the much stronger servo I'm using and the ESP32 itself. The load cell actually works great. Right off the bat, hooked it up. The first values I was receiving back into the force feedback transmitter were working really well. The steering felt much better than it ever did on the RC Hyper car. It's the most surreal RC car to drive. You're not relying on a spring to just snap the steering back to center like you would on a normal RC car. The car does return to center when it's moving. It's really strange, so you don't have to actually trim the steering in like you would on a normal spring-loaded RC transmitter. You can feel all the big bumps. You can feel when the car wants to spin out, and you can especially feel when it 
starts to understeer, which is something I've never had that sensation in an RC car. And I found myself actually drifting the car a lot easier and a lot more uh, than I've ever done before. I would say actually driving on sand or in grass gives you the most force feedback, but just because you've got so much more load going through this 20 kilogram load cell. Ultimately, I haven't had this much fun driving this car in a long time. It's actually a lot of fun to be able to drift it and have that level of control over the car. It's not perfect. I think there's some definite lag in the force feedback. I think that the filtering may be a little bit excessive and I need to work on the dampening and there's a million things, but for the number of hours that I have in the tuning of it, I'm super impressed and I think that it could do some really cool things. So for right now, I'm gonna call this a glowing success. I have some cool ideas with where I can take this and I wanna play with it some more. Obviously it has some commercial applications that I'm researching. So at this time, I'm not gonna share any of the CAD or the code. It wouldn't really be usable by anyone besides myself anyways. Right now it's too rough and extremely narrowly focused for the particular components and cars that I'm using. But I hope you all found this kind of interesting and maybe even inspiring for some projects that you're working on. Until next time, stay safe out there.